We are on the air, and let's get our little clickety-clack thing going. Hello, Evolution Hour! As usual, the old RJ is kind of crushed for time, and so I'm just getting things going. And uh, I like to see the cute little clocks and typewriter stuff that nobody uses anymore. It's welcome to Evolution Hour and Troubles in Paradise, the methodology of creationism project, where I am attempting with many people who can help to obliterate creationism on a scale they've never dealt with before. And um, uh, Jackson Wheat's here, my co-author for uh, the new uh, Rocks are Still There book. And uh, I wanted to point out, I, I put an invite over to Pologia. Um, he usually is busy this time of day over in Canada, so he, he typically can never show up on these things, although once in a while he'll pop in, in the um, uh, follow-up thing just watching. But he did a really new, neat new show on uh, Ken Ham's latest sperm and our dear friend George Purdom. Uh, complaining about climate change and making the mistake of relying on uh, ideologues who are relying on f falsifying the data field at primary source level. And so I, I had to put these links in the last minute so that I can get back to the video because I do really want to comment on it on his end. And I want to actually reference him in, in my own tip project and uh, also track down all the little technical papers on there because this looks like flat out manipulation of source material at primary source level. And it doesn't surprise me at all that they would do that. So here, Georgia Purdom, this will come as a shock to you, Jackson. The idea that Georgia Purdom could rely on somebody else to tell her something that she wants to be true, and then she doesn't fact check it. Shocked. Shocked. Yeah, yeah, I just can't imagine that happening. Uh, anyway, uh, we're into a new chapter of Contested Boats, uh, Rupi and Sanford's book, where they're trying to demolish all of evolution. And uh, it's, as you may have noticed, if you've been watching, I've, I've, I realized I was tired of figuring out what the damn Roman numerals were supposed to be. So I've switched to Arabic numbers now on, on the thing. I didn't realize this would quite go this long, but that, that's the way it is. Um, so where I think we're at like uh, in issue 89 or something like that uh, of the whole series. But anyway, uh, now they're into a new bit where they're trying to argue that Australopiths and man coexisted. Dun, 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 which is twaddle because our human species only goes back a couple hundred thousand years, by which time every Australopithecine was long gone. So they've got to be doing a shell game. They've got to be trying to drag Homo, the genus, back to that period in which they assume that everything that gets sort of saying like you, Homo, so it falls within that category, is therefore human beings. Uh, and so uh, that's presumably they're going to be dragging in uh, Australopithecus sediba, uh, which <laughs> we know the confusions that can deal with on that front, uh, and uh, Homo habilis and Homo erectus and all the rest. But by never defining what the details are and what an almost would look like and just pigeonholing, they're in trouble. But the problem is, is they get in trouble right off the bat uh, because of that, um, the very first uh, couple paragraphs in here, uh, they talk about the bones that are described being indistinguishable from those of modern humans. They don't offer a source citation on that. Uh, they were talking about um, uh, this paper from Lee Berger and an old 1976 review they quoted from, which is just way out of date. But anyway, they get down to this with, um, material on baboons and they link it to just the link of the press release. And I put the linkage in on that, but also the original paper that was being discussed. And as they put it, these included bones that appeared to be fully human, bones that appeared to be Australopith and bones of other animals such as zebra, antelope, and even baboon. Citation to that. Uh, there are no discussion of that other aspect at all, let alone that there are human beings in the baboon deposits that they found. And so I linked the paper to it. So wherever they're getting this from, <laughs> it's not actually the sciences. They're starting to get a little bit too far off on, on the... Um, um, uh, frame there. And it's the same pattern over and over and over again. They can never have anything other than just apes and people, and there can never be anything in the middle. And you and there's been no description whatsoever anywhere in the book. Uh, although I did put a new bit in the rocks were there because they kind of sort of sound like they accept speciation at this point, because they talk about it is true that on rare occasions, an ancestor species might split to give rise to two descendant species. And the example that they give are uh, dogs come from wolves. That's apparently they can far go. But theoretically, they've just propped the door open 
on speciation. So I, I put that into the new rocks book as well as kind of an isolated instance of um, accepting it. But it's where the rubber hits the road that you need to work out. If creationists want to present an argument for their model, then go ahead and do it. But they need to really do it in that they need to work out what they think happened, when they think it happened, and analyze rigorously what their model is and fairly represent where they have problems with it and all the rest. And they, they've never done that. You've, you've been reading over all those Answers in Genesis books, and I, I have my reflection. Have you ever seen a spot where they describe what evidence they'd accept? Nope. Zero percent success anybody, rate. Yeah, if anybody in the feed or anybody knows of any creationist or anti-evolutionist in well, any area whatsoever actually, who's ever done that, let me know. I do have to say, I do have to to put a caveat on that. They, mm -hmm. I have actually seen them say what they would expect. However, what they would expect is precisely what would destroy evolutionary theory. Yeah. The crocodile, Chimera. for instance. Or yeah. uh, as Georgia Purdom and Bodie Hodge, again, Purdom's a geneticist. Why would she think this? Do a dog cat cross or a horse yeah. cow cross. Yeah. Uh, so they, 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 they put up as their example the very thing that would be impossible from an evolutionary perspective. And so the fact that the impossible doesn't occur proves that evolution is wrong. No, uh, it doesn't do. But they, that, and that's why as part of the source methods approach, if you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with people, uh, in a debate context, particularly, or in an online exchange, you want to put forward the question. And if you've been following me on Twitter, you see me do this all the time and you see nobody ever answering it, is what would you accept? What would it need to look like? Uh, I did this uh, with in a letter exchange with Jonathan Wells way back on Archaeopteryx, but it'll apply literally to anything. I do it on the reptile mammal transition all the time, uh, but on whales, on hominids, on any, and so whatever. If you are a paleontology groupie, if you're not, just never mind. Um, I'll move on to a different uh, a zone. But if you're a paleontology groupie that likes to discuss the paleontology with creationists, uh, pick a particular example that you really love and you know inside out because you're just interested in that generally and find out what they think is going on there. You'll find that they are criticizing transitions that have been put forward, but you can, can never pin them down. Literally, you will never be able to pin them down as to what they would expect. So uh, the example I use with Archaeopteryx uh, is an easy one. You, and make it a thought experiment. Make it, make it a visual. Imagine that Archaeopteryx is sitting right... Imagine you're debating somebody and you say, right over there on that table, there's Archaeopteryx. One has just landed. And it's got its various features. Now, tell us what a perfect transition between reptile or dinosaur and bird would look like that you would accept, that you would go, well, duh, that's a transition. I can't argue with that. Please explain what that looks like and how you can tell the difference between that and Archaeopteryx. And I guarantee you, you're going to get crickets at that point because they have literally never thought out what they would accept as evidence. Their brain doesn't think about it. They never conceptualize it. This is a 100% failure rate. So all you will get is, well, it, literally Jonathan Wells' response to me on this example was, well, I haven't thought about that. But Archaeopteryx is a bad example of an intermediate. And he just jumps back to the trope because his brain literally won't do that. And I, I would suggest if there if you can ever find a counterexample to the, this, please let me know because it will be break out the champagne gobsmacking astonishment that an anti-evolutionist will have actually thought through this problem. Uh, so um, uh, I love to hear about all of that. Uh, let's see what's going on. Yeah, good old, Archaeopteryx is still a delightful um, example of a transitional form. We've got a lot more now. We're still, the reason why I love using the reptile mammal transition more than, more than birds is because there's still that no fossil land prior to Archaeopteryx where there's very few examples and uh, right. to go by to be able to get a sense of where Archaeopteryx is coming from in the field of things. It's, it's appearing in an archipelago of islands at the time in the middle of a big ocean uh, and and uh, Alan Fiducia, in his more lucid moments, actually brought up uh, a, a good point that bird speciation tends to be more uh, rapid in island chains because birds are flying to a new environment. You can see that with the Galapagos finches, you know, and they turn into a varied species because they're isolated on the little island, but they can get there because they can fly. 
But what was going on and how much earlier than Archaeopteryx, feathered theropods are, are coming on the scene and how they're playing out and how common is it. Oh. Um, the, one, the one measure I can use is that feather impressions are relatively rare until the Cretaceous, stray feather impressions, which means whether or not they're dinosaurs or birds, um, they've still not enough of them around with a lot of feathers that are just flipping down on our own until you find in the Cretaceous. The other element to remember um, is that <clears throat> feathers can be in a variety of forms. Not everything needs to be feathered all the way through to adult. That's why knowing that feather impressions are showing and feather evidence is showing up in juvenile theropods, although some of these are in the Cretaceous. And some of the examples of Cretaceous theropods that they now have found with feathers are these filamentous protofeather forms, not necessarily the full-blown pinacid feathers with the full-blown rachis and all that stuff. So there's a lot of variety going on in here. And, and I never dreamed that we would have such a rich of, of, array of data available, although the, the, the door started opening in the mid-1990s. I mentioned this in the old uh, tip uh, chapter. I think Dynamania, I was calling attention to that, where I went into Proto-Avis, your know, little friend Proto-Avis, mm -hmm. and uh, at that bunch. And uh, the, the view that I was taking is that um, the, the dinosaur bird connection was very strong, uh, that the frame shift uh, approach to figuring out the digit issue probably was the correct one, uh, and that uh, feathers were showing up as non-flight forms independently, uh, that they would be more and more seen as uh, either uh, thermal regulators or sexual display. And that's turned out to be the case. And what we're amazed with, I love the bit in the new book that we're doing, uh, where you bring up, um, oh, well, the, the damn taxa name again. It's that, um, uh, it's the one that Yi Jing or Yi Ping belongs to. Oh, the uh, little bat-like theropod. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's some of them there. But it, it apparently didn't have feathers. It had membranous things, well, but it's in the same taxonomical group, it, it at least feathers, not on the wings. But yeah, not, not on the wings, right? Yeah. The little, and the little yet, bat. The nice. other ones, others have very elaborate tail plumage that just scream sexual display. And, and that's um, all within the same family group. Is it so, Epidexipteryx, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're way better on those little recall names things than I am because I, I get tongue tangled up on things. I have to make sure I'm spelling them correctly. You know, I, I found out that I was leaving out an OR uh, in Overaptosauria uh, in in my bibliography. I go, oops, oh, bad dog. I mean, there's a... Scansoriopteryx is one of the hard ones for me, or it, the family name is Scansoriopterygidae. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the, the same thing I found when I was doing the ant section in Evolution Slam Dunk, there are a couple ant groups that are spelled so similarly yeah. that you could easily confuse them, and so I gave them a special little tag to tell them apart in the text, because I, if I'm having trouble keeping up with it, a lot of people will be exactly the same thing, that, it, that, that there's a lot of very specialized terminology, and I suspect some of the confusion that happens with some anti-evolutionists and even lay people is that they're reading a little too quickly and they don't realize those similar names aren't the same thing. Oh, it happens to and me too. And they can be really not the same thing. It's yeah, a lot of things have very similar names, either because you know they're named by the same group of people, uh, or you know they're very closely related, or something like that. And so these things are have very similar names, and it's kind of gets kind of hard to yeah. tell them apart. Oh, we're sometimes. getting a good side issue apart from Archaeopteryx in the live feed saying I hate Fiducia. I don't hate him, but nevertheless, he is the I call him the Fred Hoyle of uh, bird evolution in uh, slam dunk because he's just pushed himself into a corner. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the uh, Archaeopteryx brings up Longusquama, which is this weird little funky lizard that's got these kind uh. of, of, of of rib things coming up, but they're not ribs and they're, they're prop, they, they may or may not, it's from the Triassic. And it was one that Fiducia for a while was kind of dangling badly as a potential relative Whoa. of of the uh, uh, birds that wasn't dinosaurs because yeah. he just despises the bird dinosaur model and it's gotten harder and harder for him to defend that as the evidence just keeps piling up well not just longus guam you also had a megalankosaurus and the avicephalans who are these little group it's like oh hey their heads are kind of independently bird-like so yeah, that's and, yeah, yeah. that's convergence damn it look at yeah. the whole damn anatomy yeah the the thing the, the thing that, and i described this in uh dynamania uh is the thing that impressed me is the thing that's staring you in the face birds walk on their hind legs only they are obligatory bipeds they are agile bipeds they are try to knock the damn bird over biped holy gosh they're good at biped 
And so the idea is that it seems more reasonable, and unless everything all happened at once, that they picked up an, an anatomical system that was already bipedal. And if that, if you ask that, you go, dinosaurs, 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 theropods, theropods. It just screams at you as the group that, that even on that alone, that should be flagging it. But when you started to look at the detailed bits, and, and certainly since Ostrom in the mid-1960s noted Deinonychids, where they had the semi-lunate carpal and that, that it began to be more and more the case that what is new in birds? Birds developed aerodynamic feathers. They didn't develop feathers. They didn't develop the bipedal. They didn't develop the flow through of airflow in their bones. They didn't develop the, the, the teeter totter body arrangement. They lost their teeth. They lost the gastralia. They lost the long tail. And that became a tail plumage uh, a device on the pigastyle. And that and it's it's minor tweaking of the, the theropod dinosaur body plan, fusion. including, yeah. And including how they move their arms. That the, the, the old image of, well, what's good half a wing? Well, what does half a wing look like? And it turns out theropods have a wing. They just don't have feathers on them. And as soon as they develop feathers, they've got everything they need to do the little flappy thing. Cool. And then eventually groups specialize as flyers. And even in Archaeopteryx's case, the fact is that he didn't have a, a strong sternum. It didn't have that. That sternum appears later on in the bird lineage. Oh, yeah. uh, and it's the sternum that has the muscle attachments that allow a bird to take off from a standing start. Archaeopteryx probably had to leap or get a run going to be able to get flying and probably was fairly maneuverable, although um, uh, Henry Gee, I think, described it. says it could, Archaeopteryx could fly better than a sack of potatoes, is how he put it. <laughs> well, you know, probably all the, I think, all the different flyers probably start off as gliders. It's easy, you know, once you, you have like skin or mm, a wing yeah. or, or feathers or whatever, which are controlling your descent, suddenly all you need is to flap your wings and off yeah. you go. And there is a staggering advantage to flight. One of the things that was pointed out in a, in a um, uh, nature book, and I can't remember who the hell it was, but he, he pointed out that most animals fly. Most animals fly. <laughs> Because they're beetles. <laughs> well, that too. But, but even among mammals, uh, 900 species of bats, uh, yeah. there's a 1,000, 1,200 species of bats. They're a huge block of, uh, of uh, mammals are bats and rats, uh, and everything else is right. asterisks, you know. But, but <laughs> right. uh, among them, and that there's a gigantic selection pressure if you can, by the luck of the mutational draw, get into the flying business. Boy, is that an advantage because the ability to move past the two dimensions above and escape aerially, and you can't be chased, is spectacularly advantageous. And uh, so once you get into that niche, there's every selection pressure in favor of it. Well, so the same it's was no true surprise. of the ocean too. A, yeah, a yeah. large part of the Cambrian explosion was the transition from a two-dimensional, uh, these microbial mats and things like that to guys swimming up in the water column yeah so because suddenly you're in a three-dimensional world where your only limitation is the surface and if you're a benthic form you've got a hell of a lot of real estate it's probably no coincidence that something like the coelacanth <coughs> has survived so long as relatively unchanged the cliche living fossil <clears throat> because it lives in an environment where it's relatively predator free it can eat practically anything and it just has a nice languid little metabolism and it just goes on in its happy little environment down there in the dark and who the hell is arguing with it? Now, you find much more diversity and variation, frankly, in the ones that are fiddling on the surface, uh, that they have a different kind of environment to deal with. And we know that, in fact, you've got examples of predators who lie in wait for aquatic forms or for that matter, the other way around where there are fish that will look around and there's a bug up there on that brush and... <laughs> Archer fish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so there's there at that interface that produces much more interesting diversity, but not necessarily longevity as species go. Whereas if you're a nice bland bottom feeding stable environment out of everybody in the corners, uh there's a good chance that you'll last way longer because there's nothing to upset you. That's why. Yeah, I think the same is true probably for crocodilians. They're at their little interface, a little coastal interface, and they're pretty well adapted. <laughs> Yeah, them, yeah. So. Although they, we know how incredibly diverse they used to be. Oh yeah, they were so terrestrial partly, forms and marine uh, they, forms. They probably went through as big a bump 
in, in their, their peak of diversity was in the Mesozoic and the KT extinction upset them too. And the ones that survived were the hunkered down standard models that could estimate and do all sorts of fun things. Uh, and, uh, and relatively few lineages made it through. So what we're seeing is a pathetic remnant, a really successful remnant. It, there's yeah. a good model uh, as things go. They're durable. Uh, they're, they, they can have rapid uh, anaerobic um, uh, bursts of energy. And as anybody who tries to get too close to a crocodile and is now dinner or their leg is being munched on, they, they have lightning fast reflexes for a fraction of a second but they're not long-term runner sprinter types that the idea of, uh, that's a mammalian characteristic. You need a higher thermostat uh, to be able to pull that off <coughs> something like a, a cheetah or a lion, but even they have their limitations. And then all you need to do is to be a high sprinting energy antelope that has relatively more efficient bang for buck and speed because of its lightweight body. And you only need to wait until the damn predator runs out of steam at some point. So there's these fascinating things of animals chasing animals. And Whose so there's, side there's is God really on? Yeah, yeah. He likes to see animals attacking other animals and nematodes and all the little things because he has a sadistic streak. That's kind of weird. But it's it's it, it would be it's one of the things that made Darwin um, skeptical of the God hypothesis is because of all those parasites and weird shit that they were discovering. Uh, that there seems to be way more than the nice, tidy, happy, happy cute world where animals were there just for our benefit. Turns out some of us are, are there for the animal's benefit. <laughs> that sounds kind of weird. Anyway, um, and you, Jackson, you got a compliment there from insects on the, the good point about the beetles. Uh, oh. they're, they're, they're so incredibly diverse. My, uh, so, my zoology professor. Like that. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. My zoology professor is an entomologist by trade, and so she made a point of telling us how specious the arthropods are. <laughs> yeah, and so try try studying them. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out about the ants in Slam Dunk was that there are 20,000 species of ants. There are not 20,000 ant researchers uh, in the field. And so that try to do, you got an animal, most of which is so small that you got to use a microscope to look at the details. And this, and it was uh, a fascinating that, that very, although they've started to do a little bit of research now on that stupid uh, metapleural gland that all ants have as their diagnostic feature, but nobody is quite sure what the hell they do or if they do the same thing in all ants. Why? Because very few have even been characterized. None of them have been genotyped. None of them have been worked out on the development. I mean, try to look at an ant that has a back end the size of the end of a rice grain. <coughs> and on that is a tiny little gland that may or may not squirt something and you've got to investigate what that does and if it's in a social environment some sort of pheromone clue then you have to look at it in the ants of all the other environments that's not easy to do <laughs> so well, heck, is there any surprise that we don't understand everything about it their their phylogeny is uh in large part uh, controversial as well because it's our uh, sphica mir means are they the ancestral stock, are they an early or offshoot? Or are they just the first ant? They got a metapleural gland. So by that arbitrary divide, they're ants. But everything about yeah. them is waspy, as was pointed out uh, at the time. And so yeah. that then goes in. That's another fine example of um, a transitional form. If you're an ant nut and really into that, you can just ask the creationist, okay, what would an ancestral wasp ant look like? And how can I tell it apart from Smeka Mirma? and wait for the crickets again. <laughs> Another arthropod. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, they're they're definitely hymenopterans. They're not leaving the hymenoptera group, but the question yeah. really is just, well, which which fossil group did they come from, or is it some fossil group we're never gonna find because they didn't get yeah. preserved in amber or what have you? So. Bingo, and, and there wasn't amber until quite late in the game. So there's a lot of time frame in which you don't have an yeah. opportunity to get the information from. Uh, even though you still do find once in a while intermediate forms popping up in fleas and a few other things, but it's, it's the luck of the draw. It's the fossil genie problem. And, and anybody that tries to bring, yeah, the good old fossil genie that, that, uh, that it's odd that although we don't have every transitional form, and if you think about how rare fossilization is and how much data field there is, how much time and all that, the odds of that are really low. The fossil genie just loves evolutionists enough to have littered things that are fitting in with the time frame, from Svika Mirma to uh, Tiktaalik, and of course probanic and all the rest. That I go, if if God doesn't want me to believe in this stuff, 
they're really going out of their way to, to make it look better for evolution and not, you know, there's a, a, a crocodile really would be a thing for creation because no evolution could produce that weird thing. Yeah. That, that's plain, plain out weird chimericals plugged together stuff. Uh, and human beings were very good at imagining chimeras. The Egyptians, of course, had animal-headed gods uh, where basically they anthropomorphized powerful animals that, that they respected or feared. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, you, you graft wings on animals that don't have them. So you've got sphinxes and all this stuff uh, that um, we were good at that. But that doesn't mean that's zoology. And imagine if somebody were to take that stuff as gospel today we don't have Zeus believers or anything out there, but they, they, they might easily do that had things gone differently. Uh, uh, Ken Ham is a big proponent of grafting wings onto dinosaurs. <laughs> and Yeah, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, the insects, of course, says, uh, Jackson, we, uh, there's been a question that's been really bugging me uh -oh, lately. Oh. I know a lot about insects, but that doesn't mean I know everything. What is the explanation for insect gears? Ooh, ooh if you can't answer that, I oh, can. For what? In insect what? Yeah, there's a little tiny bug that's got a thing that's like a gear assembly. And I can't remember whether it's a grasshopper or something else that's involved. Insect it looks a bit like gears. nesting things. And yeah, they're, 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 they're flaps of, of internal cartilage stuff. Keratin, I've got, I'm not sure whether they're keratin or something it's else. But anyway, chart. they form little tiny ridgelets. This made it a big deal in the anti-evolution literature. Uh, it, was, it was pushed forward both by uh, intelligent designers and creationists. They go, aha! There is something that cannot possibly have evolved. Well, actually, there's a bit of technical literature on, on these kind of flap structures and how this is a modified version of them. And it only looks gear-like in certain views. If you look at them from other angles and things, you can see how the structures in that are going. And it allows them to do this little quick ratchet thing. Oh, mechanical um, gears and jumping insects. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's, is it's, uh, there's, uh, there's one particular in fact there's just one photograph that always gets there's thrown around and it's in black and white as his avatar on twitter yeah uh, oh, uh, uh brian puts up isis uh um coleopteratus coleopteratus plant hoppers insects puts in yeah. there we go see it's nice having things yeah that that uh, if you investigate it they're relatively recently found the people who did the work aren't creationists uh, and the, and they'll eventually be figuring all of this out. So put it in your little stack of follow-up to keep an eye out for the genetic information and the developmental biology aspect of it. But um, um, it's not something uh, I don't have right off the bat um, my uh, bibliography and stuff up, but there really was some work that the, these are modified versions of features already present in the insect. Of course. And of course. Uh, yeah, that, that's how nature works. Uh, that that um, the, the ones who bring these examples up and that plant hopper example is one that would be characteristic of virtually everything you get in anti-evolutionism is there's this gee whiz quality where they will see something that superficially looks like a whiz bang thing and then their brain shuts down and they never investigate anything about it. They don't try to find out what work has been done. They don't do the work themselves and they'll often drop the subject if it, if it doesn't go anywhere. Um, uh, that it, or be simply treated as a little trope that gets repeated from older and older stuff. I seem to think it was like three or four years ago even when this thing hit. And I, I imagine the people that have discovered it and people around that will diligently be trying to work out what the hell was going on. So it's, it's not an easy problem to resolve because you'd have to go into the genetics of it. You'd have to do gene knockouts. You know, you got a $500,000 grant to do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it seems like it's just it's just a sort of a little outgrowth of their exoskeletons. All it looks like, yeah, and, and it, it's an intriguing <laughs> thing. Um, but um, um, the principle is that everything that happens is natural, and so if you want to put a bet on magic creation, go ahead. But um, these I issues gradually get figured out because humans are terribly curious, and the scientists love to figure all this stuff out. And ultimately, they all have a natural explanation. Duh. Uh, yep. So there we go. Well, let me stop briefly for my obligatory um, um, uh, thank the patrons. We did and, talk about uh, plant and, hoppers and uh, zoology, but I hadn't heard about any gears. Yeah, they're a minor detail. They, they're not common, uh, but it, it becomes a trope in creationism. Anything that seems as if 
it's an example of a supposedly irreducibly complex or impossible to evolve stuff. And you get a bunch of these little tropes, most of which were pioneered in the creationism literature. Some of the intelligent designers will ferret some of these things out on their own or copy some of these things. And so looking out the provenance as to who talks about it, or for that matter, just for method, comparing intelligent designer versions of this with the young earth creationists, you'll find they're doing exactly the same tropes and tricks in both of them. So even though one is a young earth model and the other one isn't, they all argue about the same. Gee whiz, you can't explain this. Well, we'll see about that. Anyway, let me uh, put my little screen share up on here again. And old RJ's hunting around for his damn share button. There we go. And then I got to go to the damned application window. They modified all of this stuff so that it's harder to get to things. So hopefully everybody is seeing that now. And there are my patrons. Thank you. The upper level colleagues, Hendrel and Eric, and our and our researchers, Keith and Fino and Brad and Ralph and Meet Convert and Palogia and Sur. And then our assistant researchers, Dire Wolf, Duranku, James Fitzwater, Kyle Frick, Nanya, Stagel, Suris, and Dodges Rial. Still got to get back to the uh, Paralogs of Fog uh, um, work on that. It's been swamped with stuff. Now that it's getting warmer and that staying up into the wee hours in the night will be a lot easier to worry about. Anyway, and then friends, Eat Meal and Stephen and Marigail and Insects are Cool. Hi, Insects are Cool in the feed. Daniel and Bo and Alex and Paul and Zeshi and some legacy patrons who were able to help for a while but have, been, have to give up because of financial circumstances and that that's the way of life. Uh, Jen and John and Andrew and Mona and Sun Sky and Everett Vincent. Andrew was kind of apologetic about that uh, because of uh, financial circumstances had to pull off the Patreon thing, but no, that's no thing to apologize for. I'm on a limited budget here. I know exactly what it means to have a, a limited budget. I am lucky in the fact that I don't have any health issues, so I don't have uh, ills to worry about in that respect. And there are a lot of people out there who do not have that kind of a circumstance. So they've got a lot more on their plate than I do. Um, uh, so long as I can keep up with the bills and, and the ink, and uh, eat and food and that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm scraping along on there, but uh, I will still uh, ask people to do uh, uh, help out if they can, if they've got a little spare thing, the cost of a latte or something like that. Um, great. And um, the um, uh, whole issue, I put the links, by the way, in the uh, video feed for both um, uh, the GoFundMe and uh, the Patreon bit. Uh, ideally, if I can build up to a bigger group of 50, uh, 100, uh, 150, 200 people who are, are just putting a little five bucks a month or a buck a month, something like that, you can do 10 bucks a month and that that's profligate than that. But, you know, you, you find that level easily at, at, in uh, uh, public broadcasting uh, funding and that. So that, those sorts of things by having lots of people who say, yep, RJ is not a jerk. He's actually doing something important that no one's done before and is trying to, to, to pull things together in a way on a, on a shoestring non-budget, but this stuff is actually important work. Um, I, I've been stressing again and again and again the whole point about source methods. This is the Swiss Army Knife super tool of, that, that goes after everything. It's a universal toolkit. And when you look at what Jackson does and what Pelogia does in his videos and what so many people do, that is, is stuff I commend enormously. I didn't invent the notion, is that when people make controversial claims, you find out where they're getting their sources from. And if they're secondary sources, that's a warning sign. And if you can track down to a primary source, find out if that's a reliable source or not. If it's some weird pseudoscience thing that turns out to be from some website, that's a warning flag right there. If it's technical literature and you discover that the secondary sources are misrepresenting it, which you routinely find in the case of pseudoscience, now look what you've done. You've learned more about the subject. You've encountered the primary source technical material. You know their subject better than they do. You're, you have suddenly strengthened your argument. And when you respond to them, you can do so at primary source level in a game they can't play because they probably never bothered. If they're secondary source addicts, they've never looked at the primary sources. And uh, Jackson can attest on this because both of us have, I have, have debated Standing for Truth, who is a secondary source addict on a colossal scale, and you can't get him to do source methods for love or money. You triggered my PTSD, RJ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? It's only getting worse. If you... if. Uh, I know that 
Rational Mind and Nestle get, follow him for some ungodly reason. Uh, Masochism. And, I guess. Uh, but they, well, they if, they're, if they're a methods person, it's because if you if you're interested in that particular topic, following their oeuvre is useful because well, it allows you to measure their method by the sheer repetition. And of course, standing is just monumentally repetitive. I he mean, hasn't come up with original ideas. Lisa brings up an important point, um, R, uh, but RJ, sometimes primary sources are almost impossible to find. It depends on the area. Uh, I'll tell you that in most science areas these days, biological information is really accessible, either directly through their journals, of which things like PNAS and and Journal of Botany and stuff like that. If not their uh, not the current issues, at the very least, back issues are open access. Plus. Uh, Academia EDU, ResearchGate, and various other venues at Google searching. Uh, the the uh, courses will be taught on the subjects, and, and a lot of the technical papers are posted by the professors, open access online. So keep an eye out. What you want to do best is not only Google for topics, but Google the actual title of the paper, because that will pull up venues where that paper is actually accessible. And then poke around and find one that don't cost you anything. <laughs> and I know all about that. And there are, there are various ways. Then sometimes you can get connected. Um, in, in desperation, in some cases, I've contacted the professor. I've emailed the author. And most odd times, they'll just send you the paper. They'll be happy to do so. So there's a variety of things that pop up there. Geology uh, still is a, a fairly limited range. A lot of that stuff is not open access. And a lot of it isn't online a lot. Uh, and and paleontology, a bit less so. They've gotten a little more open areas. What you'll notice about both of those is their fields that these are not places where you make a hell of a lot of money. These are not the glamour disciplines. Nobody but an idiot is going to be a geologist or a paleontologist unless they really want to be that because you're walking around in awkward spots in heat and cold and chipping away at things and it's dirty, grimy, boring, repetitive work and not Please in a pleasant environment. You really feel yeah. And and therefore, if, if you're talking to a geologist or a paleontologist, you're talking to somebody who adores their work. They would do it if nobody paid them at all. They obviously want to get grants and other kinds of things. And that's literally they're true in my case. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's a matter of of uh, the true love of the discipline. And uh, um, so those technical journals, you, you, you might just contact the actual person involved. The area that I found terrible for accessibility is a lot of the old uh, scholarly literature in the philosophy and uh, ethnography and history department. So when I want to look at some of these things, when I bump into a wall most often is I'm trying to find out what's the scholarly position on this particular uh, uh, archeological site that's related to the Hittites that pops up in uh, uh, religious apologetics. And that's often really hard to find. Uh, that uh, uh, hunting around to try to find the primary source of um, uh, archaeological work on that can sometimes be difficult. But I will suspect that as more and more of the material gets online, that changes. Another thing to remember, if you are in an area that's got universities, um, go to their library and ask. Sometimes they will be helpful as all get out and will even search out the articles for you in their online systems and, uh, and, and your public library as well, because a lot of these things are connected up. Not everything will be accessible, however. And so there's, uh, there are examples of things, uh, some obscure technical journals that, uh, aren't, that never got archived online or a few instances of ones where you look back and it's only like the last 15 years that have been archived. Well, if you're looking for an article from 1972, you're screwed. So um, uh, those things can happen. But on most topics that are brought up by creationists, um, most of the technical literature will be available somewhere eventually. It may, you may have to wait a bit. Oh, jump in, Jeff. Although we did uh, an interesting sidebar. RJ and I found uh, in researching one creationist that he published in a sort of bizarre semi-technical journal is on the the one on insects. Do you remember that? Uh, oh. It's like this guy published on. I can't remember his name. I'll have to go through and look it up again. But anyways, he this guy published. I think he's an Islamic apologist. Oh oh uh, oh gosh yes yeah yeah I can't remember his name either. Yeah, yes, but he, he published and they're just really ghastly articles. They're just yeah. monumentally stupid. 
and uh, badly, uh, the, uh, uh, it's presumably not his native language, English, and, and it shows. I mean, there are well, weird spellings I mean, and strange yeah, circumstances. He, uh, yeah. he, pu he publishes a, a very bad uh, article in a sort of weird journal. It's like, is this journal, it seems like it might be credible for some of the other stuff on there. Like there are papers about uh, what seems like maybe uh, graduate students or something uh, looking at or doing experiments on the ranges of certain like butterflies or something like that. That was yeah. one of the papers on there. It was very bizarre. It's like, what have we found? Yeah, and, <laughs> and you have to remember, uh, don't presume that a technical journal is a legit technical journal just because it sounds like one. Oh, and absolutely. even some of the stuff that runs through Springer and Elsevier and that, some of those are yeah. questionable. I've, and so yeah. look to see who gets published in them. You can look up on Wikipedia to find out what kind of references and, and, and a discussion about them. Um, some of them may be air quotes peer reviewed, but they're really relatively minor. I can tell by sheer volume. Uh, that um, when I get a, a thing where I'm looking at a technical journal and I'm getting the format to put into my bibliography and it says, oh, that shows up a lot, the word processor says, and, and it doesn't even bother showing me. I have to click down to open up the thing. That's a, a popular journal. And the odds of those being uh, questionable are way less than one where you call up the journal and, and I find that there's been like two articles on it or, uh, that are in the yeah. thing. Or be cautious if if a paper is only available as an abstract, because sometimes creationists yeah. publish seemingly technical work only as an abstract, and then they'll, yeah. and then a bunch of them will cite that paper. So, and sometimes they'll be citing just the abstract of regular technical papers. Uh, if a right. paper, as some of the technical papers will be ones that will have been presented at conferences, right. and of course, creationists often are members of actual con uh, a geological society and others, and so they present their little flap do and it's all done in, in cute little buzzwords, but it's reflecting their perspective and no one can stop them because they're uh, um, a part of the ones that do their little presentations. But if it doesn't get published anywhere after that, or if it shows up at the uh, an Institute for Creation Research or something like that, that's giving you an indication that this is something not quite what it appears to be. So these are all things you learn over time. Uh, uh, BJ says, uh, uh, James and Jackson, at least when you talk with a YEC or you don't get an annoying hit on. Last night, the guy was talking about being married to me. Sigh. Ooh, that, that, that person has issues. <laughs> I, I only get the, uh, the occasional bots who dm me asking for where i live and i think uh, that's a little weird <laughs> yeah i haven't gotten all that but the one advantage of being an old fart is that you're much less likely to be hit upon by people who are not old farts and i'm not interested well, they're not in even old. humans they're just little bots <laughs> oh yeah they're yeah you know, well that's always fun uh to try to find out who's what and then of course the po trolls uh, uh, there are there are quite a few of those. What what you find is the networking. There's like if if you've ever been in an environment that has like gnats that come out at certain times of day to do their thing, and they're in just vast clusters like this for about this 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you get these clusters of things. There's Cassandra and hacking and J cats and Deep oh, and uh, PVSN and a few others and uh, and Timothy. Uh, who, who are in a, a, a circle jerk of likes with each other. And the irony is, of course, they have mutually incompatible philosophies. I mean, Deep is a Muslim, and uh, PVSM is railing on about skeptics all the time. Uh, it's, it, it's a meaningless term in his phrase. Cassandra, I haven't a clue what she believes in. She's kind of vaguely new agey, but whatever. She has no, uh, no discernible opinions on anything. Uh, and uh, uh, Hacking is a creationist, and J-Cats is a creationist. Both Hacking and J-Cats have just turned on new names. They used to be something else, and so that's Andrew another thing to walk Cats, wasn't he? Uh Yeah, Jandrew became J-Cats, uh, but he was he's still the same stuff, and he doesn't change his core thing, because I keep track of the actual core address, not just the screen name. Right. So if they change the thing to another thing, when I search, I can find out what their original screen. The one who was notorious for this was that nasty little Henio, uh, or Henko, uh, who was an anti-Semitic, homophobic, nincompoop creationist. And, and he was so vile, he constantly was getting bumped off of things and reported for uh, bad behavior and all of that. And he went through a list so long, you could it's just, it was like a daisy chain of, of like, what, who's the new Henko for the month? Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I'm just me. I don't change a damn thing. I have my mug up. I'm not anonymous. 
I put my yeah. single thing up and it's me. I'm here to say what I think is true and defend what I believe is true and have the evidence for it. And yeah. and if you want to take me on, well, you better well, want to discuss the reptile mammal transition. I really do appreciate that. And I really appreciate it even more in more recent times where I have to deal where as I am out there more and more, I come into contact with more creationists and trolls. And I think, you know, it would be really nice to just know who this guy is mm -hmm. uh, yeah. or because they have because creationists on Twitter have balls the size of houses until you ask them to come on YouTube for a chat. Then suddenly they evaporate. And it's like, huh, <laughs> how curious. Yeah, yeah. And what I try to do in those sorts of things, you're never going to persuade them that they're wrong. I mean, just forget it. Uh, somebody that has that kind of a Tortukan mindset, they're impervious. What their utility is are the people in the thread who are observing this from afar and they're seeing the nutball creationist and then the evolution defender. And I want in source methods to say, you know, that RJ guy doesn't use insults and he's always fair and he has his sources and he's constantly trying to get people to discuss primary source material. And he, and, and that's different what from what the creationist does <laughs> when you can, and, and that that will be visible to people. Hopefully will make a difference that people realize, you know, and, and then they'll get caught up on the method. Maybe I ought to find out what that source is and read that. Uh -oh. Oh, yeah. bum, bum, uh, bum. Aaron Christopher Lee just, uh, not too long ago was just introduced to the source methods. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a delicious. Oh, uh, before time runs out, I'll point out the other half of the link that I got on here. Uh, our little friend, Jeffrey Tompkins, isn't he a sweetie? The gift that keeps on giving. Uh, he had a thing on a time for everything, your body's internal clock. And it was actually linked to by AIG. And it's a little puff piece in answers magazine uh, from just the uh, August of 2018. Not a single source in it. He's just going on about how the human circadian clock is designed and it's so wonderful and providential. Oh. And so I put some links up to some of the technical papers on the origin and evolution of circadian clocks and how they go way back deep, deep, deep. They're these cryptochromes that don't really start out as clocks per se. They're just responding to light and before even light to something else. And so it's, it's a fascinating long-term thing of how yeah. these things have connected up in the evolutionary sequence and it's fun neat stuff i had a bio one teacher who talked about how you can how you can do that with plants if you expose them to like light and then darkness and you increase the number of times they're exposed to light they'll go through their whole rhythm like every time no matter how many times yeah. you do it with a certain yeah period. because it's, it, there's an automated system and stuff going on there and it's had the we presumably there's been a slight adjustment just from the fact that the day has gradually gotten shorter. Although the amount of dropping in daytime as the earth gradually uh, uh, increasing the amount of, uh, uh, of length of the day, uh, by the time you get down to plants uh, on land, um, you're, that's uh, slowed down considerably. Uh, you're billions of years after the time, it was like 15 hours uh, and there, there was nothing life on the planet at all. And another little thing that popped up today uh, I happen to um, get the, the feeds from Matthew Heron, who was a guest on the show and has uh, um, been a delightful one to deal with. Anyway, um, he took on a thing that was one of the great surveys I've ever seen. Intelligent design advocates tell me what I believe. And I immediately realized <laughs> this is about materialism. And and he, he went through, he uh, put examples up. These were all names I was familiar with. And I'm going, boy, you really did a good job of pulling all this together. So I'm, I'm putting it in and citing it in the new book, Re- um, uh, Bodhi Hodge's side swipe at materialism and Satan uh, in the, right. the answers book. But anyway, it's Barry Arrington and Denise O'Leary and William Murray and Klinghoffer and Ann Gager and Wesley Smith and Michael Egner. I mean, it's, a, it's just a, a, a one, wonderful bit. And there was the last paragraphs or two. I'll just read it aloud because it was, it was such a, a, a perfect summary of it. And I'm putting that in the new book in chapter six that I'm working on. It says, I am really awful, according to these folks, stupid, racist, unethical and immoral, depraved, an advocate of violence and a Holocaust apologist, not to mention ignorant, deeply ignorant. I believe all kinds of absurd things, such as that life and minds don't exist and that humans are coal. I deny reality and spread my impoverished superstition like the intellectual darkness it is. I can understand if you don't want to be friends with me. I never know how horrible I am. I don't even want to be friends with me anymore. 
For the record, I don't believe any of these things. I don't espouse violence. I don't think the Holocaust was okay or that children are equivalent to isopods or that humans are nothing but carbon. I believe in life, love, minds, rational thought, and intellectual freedom. Why then do intelligent design advocates say all these things about me? Why do they want you to believe that I'm a stupid, ignorant, evil person? And uh, the, the point that I'm making in the, in the chapter edition is that this is all part of that frame that creationists have been having. This is a part of a kind of a hellfire apologetic where if you don't accept their version of things because all goodness and virtue and truth comes from God, their version of God, then boom, you're out in Satan's land. And uh, um, the intelligent designers don't drag Satan onto the field very often, but, but creationist Bodhi Hodge did. And uh, so you get this very... Um, a slippery slope extremist hyperbole going on there. And then he went on mistake to actually try to discuss, this was in a section on air quotes, genetic information. This is the wind up. This was his intro to that in, in that answers book. I was, I was as amazed as you are that, that, that he would, that he would go out of his way to do that. But when you understand the frame they're coming from, um, it's understandable, weird, but understandable. That was Mike Riddle. Oh, Mike Riddle. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, oh, like, um, yeah, Riddle's thing. Yeah. Uh, oh, in yeah, fact, I, I put a, a yes because I put I changed the text to to have the opening segment. Uh, it says riddle me this: What does genetic information have to do with Satan? I think or something well, like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Riddle has he just goes on these bizarre tirades that are totally like uh, politically uh, inclined and all this other stuff it's like what the heck does this have to do with anything i mean his whole bit yeah. on materialism was was astounding because he for one thing he gets his history backwards he yeah. he makes the argument that materialism evolved in response to the to christianity it's like uh no these oh, it's <laughs> even worse than that before. it was even worse than that jackson because he got it not only backwards but inside out because <laughs> of the 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 weird notion that he had that all the bad things that are going on in the world are Satan's doing. The problem is there is the history of Christianity and religions in general to deal with, which he didn't. And right. so I've been putting in some references on um, um, the the whole that problem you've already covered about. Gary Parker. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, we we, we, we uh, I'll tell you this is going to be a juicy book, gang. Uh, that uh, if you liked uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, and if you haven't got Evolution Slam Dunk, why the hell not? Um, it's it's a, a, a kick-butt book on a subject. Literally, you will have never heard about all this information altogether in one place. You cannot find this stuff online because nobody had ever thought to pull all this stuff together before. The reptile mammal transition was way underserved in the apologetics, and nobody had ever poked at everybody that brought up the topic before. Well, I did. And now... Uh, Jackson and I are taking that same principle up a notch to deal not just with this focused topic of the reptile mammal transition, which comes up in passing, but that exploding circus tent of, of young earth creationism that just tramples so many different disciplines on such colossal scale. And it was an incredible opportunity to investigate all the science and the history and paleontology. And my gosh, I think both of us have learned so many delicious new things as a consequence of backing back and forth on this and, and, and tackling oh, yeah. the little tiptoes they do in those answers books. Um, I'm having to read a lot of geology stuff for this current chapter. Geology is not my strong suit. Uh, evolutionary biology and paleontology are more of my thing. And so, and so, But going through the geology, seeing what are comparing the regular technical literature to what the creationists are presenting, there's a stark difference there. Yeah, there's not a whole it's, lot of overlap. <laughs> the thing that strikes me so much about particularly the more recent work uh, is that now they have so many data points to play with that they're paying attention to paleogeography in its fullest sense. So they, that even geology papers are paying attention to what life is existing at those times. And they're able to tell because of a particular isotope ratio, the amount of erosion that's occurring in particular kinds of rocks that can only be due because of the erosion that's coming down from a mountain range that exists over there because of that geological work. And so they're building whole paleoecological community data that is just a, a fabulous detective story. And then you turn to creationism and you're getting a really simple cartoon and you never get anything more than a, even, even Snelling in his, in his citation laden pieces 
is still doing a cartoon when you actually try to figure out what does he think happened with this? <laughs> uh, I was, I, heck, I was just reading about, uh, right before this, I was reading about the end of Owning Extinction and how the the work, uh, they're looking, uh, the paper I was reading was looking at just how the Devonian extinction impacted shallow water organisms. Yeah. Like just shallow water organisms. Yeah, the, the, it's, and there's not because so, so many of these things are ones where you do have a useful data range because the critters are raining down foraminifera and other kinds of things that, that you get yep, a, a better right, record yep. for. Uh, oh, Fra uh, BJ says, is Frank uh, Turek being shifty when he says he doesn't care how old the universe or the earth is? Could it be young or old? Uh, he is being shifty, but there's a, a, a way... There's a reason why he is so shifty. Well, that he's there's an intelligent a, designer. Yeah, so. the, they don't really bother about chronology. Um, as I pointed out, the young Earth creationists are forced to deal with chronology because they have the flood occurring 2350 BC thereabouts and creation happening about 4000 BC. And there's no there's no wiggle room for them. Some can be liberal <laughs> and squeegee out to 10,000 years, but that's, you know, that's about as far as their brains can go because they've got those patriarch dates that, that don't have much telescope room to play around with. But intelligent design, and the same thing goes for our U Ross, um, that anybody who is an old earth creationist or an intelligent designer doesn't have the arc to worry about. They don't have to worry about when things lived. They can point to bacterial flagella and not bother at all about when they lived. So when, when Ken Miller tried to pin uh, Bill Dembski down on the flagellum as when did he think this designing was happened and how many design events were there, it was just airy because he'd never thought about it. And so that's another reason why one of the big four issues of met source methodology uh, is a uh, map of time. Uh, it, it has its counterparts in other weirdness, but it's basically the, what do you think happened bit? Well, and in, in the case of evolution, you're talking about paleo things. Um, in Frank Turk's case also, he's an, he's an idiot. Sorry. He's a theologian. Um, and so he's, he's <laughs> ah, but you repeat not, yourself. <laughs> he's not a scientist. He's channeling Stephen Meyer primarily, who yeah. also doesn't really give you dates for a lot of things. Uh, and so, Really, uh, he Frank Turek is a secondary of a secondary. Yeah, uh, he's, best, he's a, you know. a, a, a trawler. He's in the same boat as a Ray Comfort or a Ken Ham or a Kent Hogan. Right. These are not people fall. who are fat claimants. They're channeling yeah. other people credulously. And Turek, uh, Turek kind of restricts himself. Uh, oh, uh, what's his name with the case for Christ? Uh, Lee Strobel. Uh, he's another one that that channels the intelligent design wing. Now, is if he you look a, over, he's a designer? I oh, well, yeah. oh, oh, if you look at his books, yes, he doesn't pay any attention to young earth creationism. He is 100% oh, okay. intelligent design tropes. So okay. you get Steve Meyer and all the little gang at the Discovery Institute patting him on the back and saying, no, no, you don't have to worry about that. We've worked all of this out over in intelligent design land. Yeah, he's very, very <laughs> limited. Uh, you look okay. at somebody like Josh McDowell or his kid. Sean McDowell is a little more waffly, but he also kind of veers, he kind of tries to straddle the same um, uh, dichotomy. And um, you can tell the, the true believer ideologues because they'll be really tight. So intelligent design advocates generally avoid like the plague citing young earth creationist material. But you get now a waffle because look at how John Sanford, I'm pointing it out in the new book um, that we're doing, uh, how John Sanford stuff has started to percolate into the uncommon descent frame. And, and remember Salvador Card Cordova, uh, who yeah. was on your uh, show. He's a young earth creationist, and he's been one of those trying to slip Tompkins and all the rest into that uncommon descent frame. And Denise O'Leary, I think, uh, um, blatantly cited uh, one of Tompkins' books. I don't think she knows he's a young earth creationist. And look at how Sanford is evasive. He's done a bunch of different co-authored papers on genetic information. But right. remember, he has an ax to grind. He thinks all genetic information is only 6,000 years old. And so uh, that's the backstory of his worldview, but he keeps that under wraps. And that's another thing that I find evasive about a lot of these um, uh, duplicitous apologists is they're not coming out plainly and telling you what they think happened. I mean, if you want to be a young earth creationist, go right ahead. If you want to be a flat earther, go right ahead. But say so. Don't whiffle waffle. Don't try to hide that little ball because you'll realize that if you tell the truth, people are going to go, what? Well, if you have an idea that causes people to go, what? <laughs> you better well still put it out uh, because it's duplicitous otherwise. 
So uh, this, Courtney. um, yeah, the, the, um, um, uh, it, that's why another point that I try to make clear in the methods approach is to know the field, to know who's doing what and how they fit together. Because there are some people who will start debating with a, an intelligent design groupie and they start talking about, well, you believe in the flood. They don't necessarily right. believe in the flood. Uh, and likewise, you'll find the, the bottom feeders who will trawl and look at what Standing for Truth did uh, when he was trawling uh, Michael Behe in his more recent apology. Oh, yeah. like somebody who I doesn't mean, accept anything about young earth creationists. Well, st uh, Standing is likely channeling Hovind as he normally does. And so Hovind's well, probably... Well, not even that. You know, he, I, I think he's getting this from another font because Hovind doesn't quote well, Behe much. He well, doesn't pay much still, attention to that. Even still, like you said, he's not he standing because he doesn't fact check literally anything. Uh, <laughs> anything. He he has no idea uh, that be he functionally believes, or at least so he says that the universe is however many billions years old. He said that in uh, Darwin's black box. He, he does think that there's a universal yeah, common yeah. and, and in, in and some of the more um, rigorous creationists, at least, are fair about it. They, they, because B he is such a heavy gun on the intelligent design side, they just can't resist drawing on him because he's an authority figure. Oh. But they will usually put in the little caveats. Oh, but it should be noted that Mr. B he is not a true believer because he uh, well, yeah, accepts uh, those Perkin wrong ages, that. and we pray for him. Well, remember, Purdom uh, attacked the intelligent design movement in one of the answers books i don't remember which one it was but she has yeah. a whole chapter is the intelligent design movement christian it's yeah like, exactly oh. and and uh, <laughs> uh henry morris was taking that attitude and and uh, bill dembski had the most astonishing suck up uh to henry morris where he was as you know was going mea culpa mea culpa you know i i don't agree with you on on some little minor details like how many zeros there are in the age of the earth uh but but we're we're, we're close together compared to that nasty um, uh, Richard Dawkins materialism that's off by an infinite order of magnitude and you're going wow <laughs> so uh, th th there's the problem is that um, uh, the last thing that the accommodationist kumbaya form of anti-evolutionism wants is the splitting of the flock and so they, they, they prefer that everybody be anti-Darwin and let's not quibble over the young earth creationism aspect. And that's why I have very little respect now for Steve Meyer, who manages to do stuff with full-blown young that, earth creationists. Just and there's no discussion of their young earth creationism. The, the intelligent design movement just completely suppresses any mention that Paul Nelson is a young earth creationist. You're saying you, you just now lost respect? For Stephen, well, I, I gave him I gave him some <laughs> benefits of the doubt in other areas. At least he was being logically consistent with his sure. position when he was, say, twenty years ago, when he would freely talk about how he would be on the plane uh, going to a, an anti-evolution convention with Dwayne Gish, and he would be talking with him about the geology matters, and because he's he's been in the oil industry, and so he knows about a lot of geology right. matters. He's not his BS is anymore. in geology, I think. Yeah, and uh, although he manages BS in so many other disciplines now, that <laughs> 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 I know, snarky RJ, snarky RJ. Well, um, I mean, to be fair, he's not the only person who's making a lot of BS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know um, I, 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 I can avoid that by having a BA in history as opposed to a BS. But the, uh, the, the main point is, is that you find out about these things by looking at what they talk about, what they don't what sources they use and what they don't. And that's pure source methods. And and this was one advantage I could see why a Nestle or somebody else might be following a particular creationist religiously is to see uh, what's going. Oh yes. Uh, uh, Jackson's got to go. And, uh, and I'm, I'm past the hour anyway. So we're, we're, we're hey, doing on in here. I should probably pull the shots up. Thank you for coming. And uh, we'll be uh, dealing with uh, more in the stupid department in the weeks and months to come in July. I will actually be missing a couple things because I'll be going on a, a family visit um, at uh, an interesting little side story. But anyway, uh, that, that will be it, but that won't be till July. So um, uh, thank you for showing up, Jackson, and uh, have fun with your, your schoolwork and all those damn taxa you remember. And uh, <laughs> and so I'll be uh, shutting off in here, and we will see you next week.